Well, that was one messy and weird game, wasn't it, folks? Um, uh, welcome back, guys, to the Go247 podcast. I'm Glenn West, the senior writer here uh, at the site. Uh, joined again uh, by our contributing writer, Dylan Sanders. Um, I was in, uh, in Jordan Hare for what was a very typical LSU-Auburn matchup. There was a lot of craziness. There was a lot of uh, inconsistent play, a lot of – a lot of the issues that we've seen from this team at times this year uh, crop up. Um, but as Coach Kelly has said, really all year, this is a team of fighters. Uh, and LSU was able to pull away with the 21-17 win uh, in Auburn to get their first SEC road win under Coach Kelly. Uh, the Tigers moved to 4-1 and one on the season. Um, and we'll dig into all the great stuff from last night. You know, there was just so, so much bizarre, weird, quirky, kind of deals with with the offense with the defense with special teams uh and we'll get into all of it here but uh before we do just make sure you guys are hitting the like button and subscribing on youtube uh you know and subscribing wherever you get your podcasts from anything like that really helps us out as we try to grow this grow this network out so uh with that dylan i know you were watching from home but uh could you see the uh the pain i guess in terms of uh, having to follow this game from an LSU fan and an LSU journalist perspective. I mean, just talk about some of your opening thoughts from what this game produced last night. Yeah, well, I mean, both Louisiana teams had a crazy football weekend. Um, yeah. uh, and one ended up slightly better than the other. That was LSU. But yeah, watching it from home, you know, I missed the stadium atmosphere because uh, this is my first game watching from home. Definitely brings a different perspective of the game. I don't know, just having it focused in on, you know, the broadcast version and not being able to watch out what's happening with the entire view. Um, the uh, The broadcast had... It was weird. The broadcast did have like the crowd and stuff really low. So I couldn't, if the, if the crowd was getting rowdy, you couldn't really tell that much on the TV. It was pretty quiet. Yeah, for the most I, part. Can, I, can, I can say just from a first hands perspective, uh, we were inside an enclosed press box. So I probably heard very similar to what you were hearing uh, back at home. Um, you know, it sounded like Auburn was, was pretty rowdy to start the game and, certainly as they built that three score lead, but you know, LSU was able to kind of weather that storm and, and put up some, some good numbers there uh, in the second half, but sorry, go, go ahead. Yeah. No, and I was just saying, yeah, it was just, it was insane. It was typical LSU Auburn messiness, craziness. Um, so yeah, I mean, a win's a win in the sec at, at this point. And Hey, you got the win, and now you're ranked in the top 25, yep. albeit at 25, very, very much on the edge. But you are in the top 25 now. Yep, absolutely. I mean, um, I don't mean to toot my own horn here, but this was kind of what I was expecting in terms of just the kind of game that it was going to be. Um, I put 23-17 as my prediction. I was pretty close. I'm, I will say that. I, was, I got pretty close on that one. Um, I just thought that there was – you know, from an offensive perspective, and we can start right there, that, you know, against two quality opponents that LSU's played this year in Florida State and Mississippi State, um, they just hadn't gotten off to great starts in either of those games. I thought that might be an issue that could crop up again here against another team with some really high-level athletes on defense. Um, you know, I thought Auburn's defensive scheme was pretty solid um, in terms of stopping LSU's pass, but really what LSU did, was to themselves. I mean, at the end of the day, um, LSU's passing offense could not get going. Jaden Daniels threw for just 85 yards on the night. Um, there were drops, there were missed throws, there were uh, miscommunications. There were uh, a lot of issues with the passing offense that I think you have to be concerned about uh, as you welcome in a really high powered Tennessee team. Um, but, you know, just in terms of the game last night, I thought that there was, uh, a definite step back in terms of the passing offense. You know, we came in with such high expectations for this receiver group. Um, I think combined the receivers had four receptions in this game for like 35 yards or something. It was just a very uh, uninspiring performance. They were not able to get Kayshawn back into the fold much. I think he had one catch for four yards. Booty um, uh, Jack Besh had uh, one catch on the night. Uh, you know, I, I remember looking at uh, Malik Neighbors at one point in the second half, and they they had just missed on a throw, and Neighbors was throwing up his arms, and you could tell that there was some real frustration offensively in terms of trying to get 
uh, you know, the game going through the air. And so uh, as a result, LSU kind of leaned heavily on the run game in, uh, in the second half. Um, I thought that, you know, all four backs had their opportunities. Josh Williams, uh, I thought, really had a, a solid, solid game. Just uh, he's been, I think, Mr. Steady for you all season long. I really like what they do with Josh Williams and his role. Um, and he had some really big plays, a couple key first downs there at the end of the game. Uh, you had John Emery break through for that 20 yard touchdown run. Uh, it was great to see him pull off a play like that. Um, and, and really, you know, th- this was a story for me at least offensively, about finding a little bit of an identity on the ground. You know, you were able to get really all three of those guys uh, with Noah Kane in there as well, uh, uh, some really good work, and there was a lot of great balance. And uh, I thought it was a really great showing from LSU uh, on the run game, particularly when you're considering, you know, you're going to be missing Armani Goodwin for probably a good portion of this season, you know. think. Yeah, the broadcast pointed out last night. I guess now after this game, it'd be three to five weeks. Yeah, further. Yeah. I mean, and those hamstrings are so tricky. Like, I I wouldn't be surprised if it's longer if LSU just really wants to play it safe with him. Um, because those those hamstrings, you got to make sure they're a hundred percent right before you you trot uh, out Armani Goodwin, who's a really force forceful runner. But, um, just offensively for you, I mean, just what what did you think the story of this game was and kind of how uh, LSU looked uh, really throughout the course of the game? Well, one thing is for certain uh, drops cannot continue Yeah, at all. Drops cannot, can't happen. Uh, they are, uh, you know, I get it. You're still in college. You're not, you know, professional athletes to the point yet. Like a drop, it, a drop every now and then it's not the end of the world. You don't want it to ever happen, but to the rate as, that they're happening right now for LSU, especially with the talent of the room, it just can't happen. Another thing that I feel like can't happen is listen, we were all high on Mason Taylor. Stop running the offense through Mason Taylor. Yeah. It's not working. Like, but we, I, I think that he has a very high ceiling. Um, he has shown flashes, but he is not ready to have the offense run through him right now. And I get that that's, he's the type of player that they want to have happen, but they don't have, they don't have that this year. Maybe next year, Mac Mark away, like in the, in the future, you have some, some really good perspective tight ends coming in, in the future right now, this offense can't do that. Um, so like the fact that, that at one point, Mason Taylor had five targets. All the other receivers had one. This is just not acceptable. So at this point, they need to rework the game plan, rework what's happening. I thought it was a pretty awful game plan for the most part to start uh, on offense and apparently on defense as well, but we'll get to that. Yeah, yeah, but the offense was just uh, lifeless again. Mistake after mistake. Didn't look like they knew what they were doing. Something's got to change. And it was really, really fortunate for them that the run game started to get going. Um, and no one had any like flashy stats, but uh, there were certainly flashy plays, flashy plays, and uh, the running backs really, all three of them, really gutted out big runs whenever they needed. Yeah, no, I, I agree completely. And yeah, you know, just kind of building on the Mason Taylor thing. Um, you're right; he's not ready for a featured role in this offense. You know, I think at times. LSU has really struggled to get um, the receivers open. And I do feel like in a lot of these scenarios, Mason Taylor has been kind of the check down guy, um, kind of the, the the option that's kind of the, the safe the safe option for Daniels on a play. Um, and, you know, it, it's, you know, he had a couple balls go right through his hands. They weren't listed as drops, but they were drops. Um, you know, Daniels was certainly not accurate with the ball. Uh, on Saturday, but there were ba- many, many balls that were in the receiver's hands um, that bounced off their hands. Um, it wasn't perfect placement, and you're not going to get that, you know, on a night in, night out basis. And you got to be able to adjust. And um, it just felt like LSU was dropping a lot more of those than they should have. Um, and it, it's it's got to change. I mean, the, the passing offense has just got to be better. Um, they've got to find some more consistency there, uh, particularly early in games. Um, and yeah, I, I, I'm with you. I think there just needs to be a little bit more of a, a shift in, in kind of the game plan. Um, uh, we'll I will, I, I will say we are talking about the, the passing game, not working. There needs to be a shift. That shift is not replacing Jaden Daniels. He's a starter. I no. think it's clear 
as day, even to this point, um, that Daniels is still 110% your best option to win games this year. Yeah. Um, we, Nuss, yeah, Nuss yeah. came in. He didn't look great. Uh, he didn't look perfect. He didn't look awful. But it's it's clear that this offense needs Daniels' running ability to, to function. Absolutely. I'm with you there. And, you know, I, I, I differ a little bit with Nussmeyer just because you could tell they were throwing him out there and they, they when they put him out there, they didn't trust what he was going to be able to do for him. I mean, it, you mm-hmm. could tell uh, there were a lot of design runs, a lot of, uh, you know, run option, uh, run pass option plays that were just short throws for him to make really just to try to chew some clock. I mean, that's what it really kind of felt like mm-hmm. to me when Nussmeyer was in there. Was it super conservative? To, yeah. Yeah. Trying well, to chew some clock. And, and it, felt like, it felt like they kind of went uber conservative with him. It's mm-hmm. just so that there was not a chance of him, making yeah. one of his mistakes at that point in the game. Like yeah. it's clear that he does not have the trust of this off- of the of the coaching staff to run an offense right now. Yeah. And, and we should also point out that Jaden Daniels uh did suffer a little bit of a knee injury in that game. Um Brian Kelly told us after the game that um you know he could have gone back in if they wanted, but the way that that game was shaping up, it was going to be so heavily involved in the run um that they didn't want to risk further injury. Uh, Because they knew he was probably going to have to run at at some point if they were to throw him back out there. So um, they they, they decided to hold him out. Um, But offensively, was there anything else that kind of stood out that you wanted to touch on? Or do you think we kind of hit on all of it? I I think we did a pretty good job. Um, I I guess we could mention the O-line a little bit. Um, Yeah. You know, I thought that they were really solid in the run game uh, in the second half. I thought they were opening up some lanes. Um, They were pretty consistent as a whole. Yeah. you know, they, they, they obviously kind of came in with a, an opportunity here. They, they shifted some with Garrett Dellinger out with, you know, they moved Miles Frazier over to left guard. They inserted Anthony Bradford. Um, you know, there were some penalties. You know, LSU had, I think, six or seven penalties on offense that really cropped up and really stalled some of those drives. Um, and a lot of them were, you know, holding, uh, you know, uh, a couple false starts in there, I think, as well. But, yeah, just, just um, you know, we asked Will Campbell after the game. It just kind of was it your first – was your first SEC experience what you expected? And he, you know, he gave a little bit of a mundane answer, but, you know, kind of the overall gist of it was, yeah. And, you know, he thought that he and, and Emory Jones, who kind of built a nice little uh, one-two punch there at, at, the, at the tackle spots, played well. Um, I thought they both handled the the, the environment really well. Um, I thought they did some really good things. And, and look, Daniels in the offense, they had a lot of time to pass. I mean, it, I don't think there was an – you know, there were a couple times where I think Jaden might have held, held on to the ball a little bit too long uh, that led to a couple sacks. But I thought the protection overall uh, really throughout the night was was pretty solid. Um, and, you know, I think – uh, it, it's just it's just got to be on the quarterback. It's got to be on these receivers and these tight ends to really uh, zone in on 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 you know being more consistent catching the ball. Yeah, for sure. Um, I uh, will note that uh, at least from PFF, Emory Jones's grade dropped a ton. I don't know that what the individual uh, game grade was, but they docked him a lot on this on this game. I thought that I thought overall though they did fine. It was always going to be a rough rough time because of. I mean, the, the Auburn defensive line did look like I thought that they were going to look like. They were freaks. They were like crazy athletes. Uh, they looked really good. Um, they were going to – I, I kind of figured that they would win this battle, and they kind of did, but the LSU offensive line held up, held up enough, especially in, in the um, in the run game, I thought. Um, I do want to give a, just a shout-out to Josh Williams for – he's really been able – been a, a reliable runner that every time we mentioned him in – and spring and fall camp, everyone's like, really? Like Josh Williams is yeah. getting play? Like, but he stepped up and he he earned the start tonight. He was a he was a team captain this week. Um and, and really showed out. And then John Emery, um, kind of looking like the Emory of old at some points. Like it, he's looking like he's settling back in, which is very promising and much, much needed. Yeah, yeah. It was nice to see because we really haven't seen the Emory of old because he hasn't been here in you know several years now, but um, yeah, we're, we're it was an exciting time, I think, offensively. Just from this pr- perspective, you were able to get the run game going a little bit more consistently uh, against a, a higher level opponent, so that was good to see. Um, we could shift to defense. Um, you know, look, 
they made the plays. I think the biggest takeaway that I had last night from the defense was they've made the plays when they needed to. Um, and that's been kind of a common theme that I think you've seen in the Florida State game, in the Mississippi State game, and in this game as well. Um, against some of those higher level co- competition, um, they've they've made some really good plays and they've done some really good things. Um, but obviously last night or Saturday night, I should say, um, the secondary was just not at its best. And um, it looked like there were some communication errors. There were some busted coverages. Um, one of the things that Robbie Ashford uh, does really well that we kind of talked about on the pod last week was he's able to escape the pocket, but he's always looking downfield for throws. And I think you saw that a number of times in the first half where he was forced out of the pocket by LSU's front seven. Um, but the, the back half of the defense was getting lost with some of the receivers and some of those big plays that you saw. Um, and I think it just led to some of the confusion back there as the play extended. So that certainly has to get cleaned up. They gave up I think, you know, officially they, they recorded uh, eight different explosive plays on the day. Um, they had a couple of uh, – had an 18-yard touchdown on a busted coverage. They had a 53-yard touchdown on a busted coverage. Uh, they had the big 60-yard play that set up another scoring opportunity. Um, so there were, um, there were a lot of uh, mistakes, I think, made in that first, you know, 25 minutes or so. Um, but I really liked how they bounced back, and you kind of have to start with the way that uh, B.J. O'Jolary really stepped up in that first half by getting that strip sack uh, that was picked up by Ward for the touchdown. I think that was absolutely the play that kind of turned the momentum of the game. Um, LSU's you know defense really seemed to recover well after that one, um, and 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 they really sh- they shut out Auburn for the rest of that game. They didn't allow Auburn to score anymore. Um, after getting down 17 nothing, they you know went on to score 21 unanswered, and uh, I thought looked a lot better in the second half. There were still a couple of mis- miscues uh, in the secondary, but like I said, they made the plays. They they forced four turnovers um, on the night. Uh, I think three of those came in the fourth quarter with the the muff punt, with the interception by Perkins, and then the I mean they said it after the game, the Tyron Matthew esque play from Greg Brooks that uh, kind of sealed the deal for LSU. But um, I think, you know, you're, you're going to be walking into another game here in Tennessee where you can't afford to have some of those miscues in the secondary uh, be as prevalent uh, or be as noticeable throughout the game. So uh, what were your big defensive takeaways um, from LSU? Cause um, I know it was a, a kind of a game of, of two halves, I think for those guys. Yeah, um, the defense, uh, they have playmakers. Harold yeah. Perkins, man, what a what a guy. The the interception uh, off of Coymore was something. It was uh, – Twitter exploded. Um, what, what a week for Coymore. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, didn't expect him to throw an interception uh, and get one ripped out of his hands. But yeah. – uh, yeah, the Harold Perkins interception was humongous. They came up with plays whenever they needed them. Like the the defense um, wasn't the reason they were down seventeen zero, but they had. I mean, weren't the only reason, but they uh, definitely had a bunch of blown coverages. But the secondary really locked up. Uh, Matt House made some great adjustments. Um, it seemed, and and I haven't wa- I haven't been able to go back and rewatch the game, but. Uh, the sec- uh, the the defense looked really really good in the second half. Um, back, more to what we were used to. I mean, they shut them out after they scored the seventeen points quickly. Um, and BJ Ojolari looks like the first round talent that we've been touting since the fall. Um, and with I mean, Ali Gay at some point like he hasn't really produced that much this season. It's been it's been a very very slow start for Ali Gay. So having Harold Perkins, having having the ability to have B.J. Ojolari and Harold Perkins come off the edge at the same time is uh, really threatening. Yeah, for, no, uh, I, it's going to be hard, hard to stop. And even Savion Jones has stepped up and carved out a bigger role for himself. You're you muted. You're muted. Sorry about that. Just uh, figuring it out. There we go. Yeah, Sorry. Yeah, there you go. Uh, yeah. So. Uh, yeah, I mean, you kind of talk, touched on that for a little bit. Um, I, I would say, you know, in terms of the, the defensive line and kind of the the performance, I, I've been most impressed 
you know, probably outside of Ojalary with Mikai Wingo. I mean, he's been really solid in the run game. We've talked about him a lot uh, the last couple weeks. Um, you know, Tank Bigsby had a couple of nice runs, but they never really had any big breakaway run that set up anything for, for Auburn. Most of their big plays came through the air. So, um, you know, the fact that you're still getting a pretty solid run defense uh, has been pretty – uh, has been very encouraging, I think, for LSU um, in these first, uh, you know, five games of the season. Um, really liked uh, w- w- what Perkins did. I think they they found a role for him in terms of just being the the mess up guy. You know, they bring him in and he they they, they bring him in to rush the passer. They bring him in to you know kind of be that extra athletic body out on the middle of that field uh, to go out and make plays. And he's done a really nice job of that. Um, Matt House has done a great job kind of working with him. We've heard a lot, you know, kind of in recent weeks about how much Perkins and House are working together um, to kind of find a a really good, a good role for him. And, you know, I think probably one of the things that changed defensively, um, you know, we have to mention was, you know, they put Jarek Bernard Converse back at at safety um, kind of as that game really looked like it was about to get out of hand. Um, You know, they started the game with Joe Fusha and Greg Brooks is your two say two high safeties, um, but you could tell there were some issues back there. Um, I think it's just going to take a little bit more time for Joe to come along. Um, you know, after missing four games, you know, you got to get that game speed back. Um, and LSU looked a lot more polished back there when it was Bernard Converse playing safety, and um, you know they were able to communicate a little bit better. I think, and um, just just a little bit more consistent in that second half. Um, in terms of not letting those big plays uh, turn into points. I think that was the biggest thing that you really got a chance to see uh, in that final 30 minutes and really allowed LSU to get back in that game, take a lead and hold on to the lead. So um, really encouraged overall. Uh, I would say very um, messy um, is was the word that I, that I used after mm-hmm. the game. Um, but, and there's certainly a lot of work for improvement, but, at the end of the day, you're four and one. You're four and yeah. one heading into this uh, top ten battle against Tennessee. You're a top twenty five team, and you have a really good opportunity now to kind of showcase yourself to the SEC. And what's going to be a really early morning game? I know a lot of LSU fans aren't going to like it, um, but there is um, a good chance here that LSU can can walk out, and if they come away victorious absolutely make a statement in this conference in terms of how they're going to look under Brian Kelly, how uh, consistent they can be. Um, It's going to be one of those program defining games, I think for this year. Yeah. I I said it said in the, in the forums on the board, but uh, we, uh, you know, a a hard, uh, an ugly win is better than a hard fought loss. So, um, you know, they got away with it. It's the, it's the SEC West. You know, a lot of people thought that Auburn shouldn't have had a chance. They probably shouldn't have. Um, it was it was Jordan Hare mixed with birthday magic, uh, as they mentioned 80 times on the broadcast that it was Robbie Ashford's 20th birthday. <laughs> uh, so happy birthday, Robbie Ashford. But uh, LSU <laughs> LSU left left the party with with a dub, and that's kind of. All that really matters for this uh, for this team at this point, uh, where they're at in the program, winning SEC West games, no matter how you win them, is a positive. Um, it's always going to be tough. Uh, there's a lot of voodoo going against LSU, but they, you know, they 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 fall back. Um, it was it was a good one. Um, yeah. Overall, overall okay. thoughts. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a it's a plus, and uh, I don't think we can go without saying. I don't know if we've mentioned it, but we. You got to figure out the Keishon Booty problem. Mm-hmm. No matter what it is, something has to change with how he's being approached. Either he doesn't play because it's not working out, and at this point, uh, it's weird to say after how Im- impressive he's been. But at this point, Keishon. Oh, am I back? Am I back? All right. Sorry. Yeah, you cut out there. Um, okay. Go. 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 Sorry. Go ahead. Am I back? Yep. Okay, um, the, the Keishon Booty problem, no matter – it feels crazy to say because of how good he has been, um, but at this point, his his spot in the offense has been a net negative. Uh-huh. 
Mm-hmm. Um, it's just taking up other spots of people who have, have worked more. I'm not saying you have to bench him. Just figure out how he's being approached in the offense because if right now it's not working, he's not getting targeted all game, and then whenever he does get targeted, he's frustrated and drops the ball. Um, so something has to fit. That, that, that right now is the biggest question mark on the offense. Figure out what's going on with Kayshawn. Yep. Yep. Uh, I think that's absolutely true. Um, you know, uh, just another quick thought, special teams still very much uh, a problem. Um, they had four penalties in that first half on special teams. It cost them field position. Um, that, that needs to be, that needs to be cleaned up. And um, I'm just not sure at this point in the season, what else you can really tell those guys. I mean, like it's just been really, really poor. Um and I think Kelly, you know, certainly has you know, a lot of work to do with that. And, and you'll, we'll see what happens. But, yeah, just uh, another kind of not right night for, for special teams overall. Um, outside of the one Jay Bramblett punt that got downed inside the one, which was really nice. But, yeah, so uh, we'll move on to Tennessee. Um, you know, I think, you know, kind of just a couple early thoughts here. This is going to be. Uh, a big offensive game for, from tennis to from Tennessee. Um, you know, Hendon Hooker has looked like a really, really solid um, quarterback. Um, eight touchdowns, no picks. Um, has has completed over seventy percent of his passes. Um, just a really, really solid overall player. He's a good runner as well. Um, I guess kind of I'll I'll turn it over to you because I know you've watched some of Tennessee this year, but just. How much of this game do you think is going to be LSU's defense trying to at least sustain Tennessee's offense? And how much of it do you think it's going to need to be LSU's offense kind of moving the chains and kind of keeping this thing in their hands uh, more so than Tennessee? Well, as last game was more of a strength versus weakness and strength versus weakness kind of game, this is strength versus strength. Uh, it's, it's all LSU defense versus Tennessee offense. I've been a super high on the volunteers all season long going heading into the season. I think, uh, Josh Heupel has built a, a really good offense over there. Um, and it's going to be up to the defense to really dictate and really kind of give the LSU offense opportunities. We've seen Tennessee's defense struggle a little bit but the offense is, is run to a clip to where it doesn't really matter. Um, so it's, if, the, if the LSU defense can come out and, and slow them down a little bit uh, and, and allow LSU's offense to, to catch up, um, as of right now, it, it looks like LSU will be unable to outpace yeah. the Tennessee offense in, in a scoring battle. So the LSU defense is really going to have to strap down and, and be – be good, be great. It's not even be good. It's they're going to have to be an elite, the elite LSU defense if if they want a chance because, uh, I mean, Tennessee has a great, great quarterback, a couple of great receivers. Um, this offense, uh, super, super high tempo. Um, they run a lot of plays. They want to run a lot of plays. So, yeah, just be ready. It's going to be, it's going to be fun, but it's going to be frustrating if the LSU defense is not ready. Yeah, they have a, a really solid run game too. Um, between Jalen Wright and Jabari Small, uh, those are a couple of guys that have combined for over 100 yards a game uh, as a duo in the in, you know in the backfield. Um, that I think you know LSU's defense is going to have to really you know just be like like Dylan mentioned, you know, really really solid up front um, in terms of you know stopping the run. Uh, this is a a pretty well balanced offense. You know, they have a I think around 175 rushing attempts on the year, um, and they've thrown the ball about 110 times uh, in four games. So maybe a little bit more leaning towards the run, but um, this is an offense that's going to be able to hurt you in a lot of ways uh, if LSU isn't careful. So um, we'll certainly have a lot more on Tennessee as the week goes. Um, So make sure to keep, you know, stay tuned with us. Uh, Was there any kind of parting thought? Hinden Hooker also a very good running yeah, quarterback. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So yeah, absolutely. So you know, Robbie Ashford saw break a couple runs. Um, can't have that happen. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think in kind of Hooker's case, you know, when he's looking to run, he's looking to run. In terms of Ashford's case, where he was looking to kind of extend plays and get the ball downfield, 
Booker does feel more like a runner to me in terms of just watching him play. He's a guy that can make some stuff happen in the open field, and I think he's going to be uh, really fun to watch on 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 Saturday morning. Um, you know, before we get out of here, I know there was uh, a high school game that you got a chance to look up on Friday uh, that featured Woodlawn quarterback and LSU commit Ricky Collins. Uh, you had a chance to talk with another LSU commit, uh, Kai Preen, after the game as well. Uh, just talk about that experience and just what you were able to learn about Kai uh, and, and Ricky really throughout that game. Yeah, so I uh, I go to about I go to I go to a high school game every week. Uh, usually, whatever the best game in Baton Rouge is in terms of LSU prospects. So maybe we can start talking about that on yep. these pods to end out. Um, just a little quick note: Ricky Collins uh, looks much much improved than what we've seen, at least in highlight tapes. Um, he looks much more refined as a passer. He was making um, he was making some crazy throws. Uh, he's, he was fitting balls into really, really tight windows down the field. Uh, really impressive on the run. Um, in, in terms of off, like what he looks like, he looks like he could run the LSU offense, not today, but like if this is the LSU offensive structure that they want to run, Ricky Collins looks like he would fit right into it. Uh, super athletic, great arm. I, I mean, I'll say I've seen Eli Holstein twice and I've seen Ricky Collins once and Ricky Collins impressed me much, much more. Um, just in terms of the throws that he was making and his decision making, uh, he did throw an interception towards the end of the game, uh, which w- which seemed like a miscommunication because he was throwing it to where I mean it, it just him and the receiver aren't d- on a completely different page. Uh, but I don't just from straight missing a throw. I don't know if I if I saw him just miss a throw at all. Like he looked really really good, really really promising. He looked like a four star recruit that. Uh, I can see why LSU really went after him. Um, and then on the other side at St. James, uh, Kai Preen, Kai Preon, I think it's Preon. It might be I, Preon, I, yeah. I, th- I think uh, um, there's a little a little bit of a kick to his name. Uh, I'm pretty sure I should have asked him. Uh, but he was – it was him versus Jordan Matthews, which was a really, really fun matchup all night. And Jordan Matthews really got the edge on him for the first three quarters. Uh, Jordan Matthews, Tennessee commit – I think LSU is still going after him. LSU probably is going still going after him. If I had to, if I had to guess, there was a Tennessee coach or Tennessee scout at the game, uh, so that was interesting. Uh, but uh, anyway, Kai Preon really uh, had a great fourth quarter. Um, showed off his after the catch ability. He looks like he would be. A, he looks like he'll be an electric punt returner and kick returner. Um, even just as a receiver, he would catch the ball and make a bunch of guys miss had a really impressive play where he was uh he caught it and then was able to lateral it as he was getting tackled uh at the end of the game that gave them crucial yards and then he caught the uh game winning touchdown pass uh at the end with 16 seconds left that let St. James beat uh that led St. James to beat um Woodlawn, Woodlawn uh yeah. yeah at Woodlawn's homecoming so it was a big game uh and then so I usually don't don't try to talk to the players who just lost a big game. So I didn't talk to Ricky after the game, but I did talk to Kai. Um, and he was really, really excited about uh, committing to LSU. Um, he has been to pretty much every home game, I think. And then he's planning to come to a bunch more and loves the, loves the experience and has really, uh, really likes what he's seen from uh, whenever the, the wide receivers get working. Uh, he really likes what he sees out of the offense and the capabilities and really wants He's just really, really excited about the opportunity to come to LSU and has loved everything he's seen from the uh, coaching staff. And he's still getting talked to by pretty much all of all of the same coaches. So they're uh, they're keeping him close to home. And, yeah, he looks really, really excited to be a Tiger. Yeah, no, it's a great update. I remember watching Ricky a lot over the summer, and he's um, certainly sounding like he's trying to take that you know, summer experience and, and, and kind of feel it to some more success here as a senior. Um, LSU has a couple really good ones there and, and, and Kai Preen, Preon and, uh, and Ricky Collins. So um, with that, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll certainly be uh, around. We're going to have a lot of great content for you guys as LSU prepares for this top 25 matchup uh, against Tennessee. Um, but with that, you know, we'll, we'll probably have another pod on Friday, but until then uh, we'll certainly see you guys soon, but appreciate you.